Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Wow, did we have a day yesterday or what? <laughs> that was kind of like a marathon that we had. But it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. So welcome. If you're here with us online this morning, welcome. And uh, leave a comment in the uh, notes there to let us know that you're online with us here this morning. Uh, we kind of had a mixed bag of things going on this weekend. The weather's kind of goofy. Uh, so when I got up this morning, it was snowing. And so that, that went away and I was pretty happy about that. So didn't have to drive through it like last week. But uh, you know, the thing about it is we see that refreshing coming in. And uh, so no matter what the weather does outside, it, we get some benefit from it if you ever stop and think about that. So it's a good thing no matter what happens out there because no matter what, this is the day that the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad in it. So again, welcome. And uh, we had uh, just an awesome day yesterday with the men's breakfast first thing in the morning. And then we had that luncheon. And then we had a mini movie. And then we had the Y of Nativity that kicks off our Advent season today. And of course, this is the first uh, Sunday in Advent, which is the uh, what we call the Sunday or the week of hope. So we need to celebrate hope throughout this week. And then next week, we'll start with peace and celebrate peace and then joy and then love. And then we get to celebrate celebrate Christ as well. Sorry about that. Good to get that week going. And I'm trying not to do this as I talk today. <laughs> I hit it yesterday, so... <laughs> I kind of learned my lesson last night, so I'm kind of shifting this way a bit today. <laughs> so Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to start off our four-week Advent series on Why the Nativity. And we're going to answer the questions throughout this next four weeks of why did Jesus become a man? And we're going to hear that from Pastor Terry today. The next week, why Joseph? The week after that is why Mary? And then uh, the fourth week is why call him Savior? And so uh, we've got a lot of really good information, um, some clips from the movies and, and things like that. But it, I thought that movie was very, very well done. I thought it was awesome. What did you guys think? Great, yeah. We'll have to get you the movie so you can see it. Um, so Friday, we started our new Christmas tradition and that is reading one chapter in Luke each day. So you should be up to three, and today you should have gone through all the names of who is the son of whom. I mean, there's probably a list of 30 of them getting all the way back. And so we went all the way back to Adam with it, and we traced that lineage all the way back to show that he was from the house of Abraham and the house of David, both, to show that that fulfilled the prophecy. And so as we go through this tradition, one chapter each day, there's 24 chapters of Luke, so... Christmas Eve, we have gone through the entire story of Jesus. And that gives you the reason of why the nativity. So on Christmas Eve, we're planning to have that candlelight service. Now, it all depends on what time of day, so we sent out a, a, uh, a survey for everyone to vote on what your favorite times were, and we gave you three or four times. Three? Four, three. Okay, three times. So if you haven't voted, get the vote in, because we want to make the announcement yet this week so that we can have everyone plan for it. So uh, Christmas Eve service, we're going to have our normal service at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then we'll have the candlelight service in the evening. And that's always a special time for everyone. So Next weekend, next Saturday, we're going to do some Christmas caroling. We're going to have chili in here. We're going to have cornbread, wassail drink, great times. It's going to be a fun time. So invite your friends to come along with us. We don't care if they don't go to church here. If they've got a, a voice that would like to be lifted up, we don't have to say it'd be a good one. But if they have a voice that would be like to be lifted up, we'd love to have them along with us. And um, Denise has been gracious enough to contact some care centers and, and people that uh, we're going to stop and, and carol at. And that always lifts those people up like I can tell you. Because uh, there's a lot of times where a lot of these people, uh, when, when Dad was in the care facilities in there, there were people there that never got visited the entire time we were there. Never. Not once. And that's terrible. 
and, and these people are just lonely and just they just sit and, and wait for someone to talk to. Um, so Christmas caroling on the 9th, we're going to start here with the meal at the church, then we're going to go out and carol, so we'll probably meet here around 11. <laughs> Terry's back there going like this, so is that like <laughs> one? <laughs> uh, so we're going to meet up at about 11 o'clock and then we'll go out for caroling then. Uh, a lot of these people, we don't want to go in the evenings because we got to kind of fit it in between meal times and everything for them. And, and so we want to make sure that that's going to work out well for them on the on the uh, same run. So then we have uh, our celebration of Christmas on the 25th. Um, you get the day off. We get the day off. It's kind of a cool thing. But starting the new year out, we're going to start the new year out right. And January 6th, we're going to be showing a bridge to Terabithia in the evening, in the morning. We have men's breakfast again. So it's going to be one of those fun days. We get to shift things around all over the place. Um, so men's breakfast at uh, January 6th, 9 o'clock in the morning. And we always have a plethora of food available. Yes. And so it's, it's kind of fun because Russ Kegbein will show up, you know, probably every other month or so. Well, now that the, uh, now that the farmer's markets aren't going on, he'll probably be here on a regular basis. But he shows up and he'll just bring a surprise dish in. So we never know what it's going to be. <laughs> Yesterday it was breakfast potatoes with onions and peppers and everything that was all sauteed up and then baked with cheese over the top. It was it was horrible. You, you really didn't want to eat much of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was really good. It was really good. So, uh, so then in that evening we're going to be showing the, the movie The Bridge to Terabithia. And you see the two uh, teens up there that uh, come together in school. And uh, she's the new girl that comes to school. And, and he's the track champion of the school. And they have the foot race out there. So one of the first things that happens is she beats him in the race. So now she's the fastest one in the class. But they also have a bunch of personal issues and struggles that they're having to deal with and go through. And so they became enemies right away. But through all the struggles that they went through, they become very close friends. And so the bridge to Terabithia is a story of, of emotion and healing and how to get through things and how to go through some bad things that you're going through as a kid and how to come out the other side much better in the process. And so it's a really redeeming story. It's, it's very good. Uh, so can't wait to see that. And it's. As you can see, they, they've got some creatures in there and some other things that in this make-believe world that they use to cope with the bullying and all the rest of the stuff that goes on in their lives. And it's a great, great movie. Um, so this will be the second time that we've we've shown it and, and went through a study on it and, and things like that, um, healing and restoration. And so uh, we'll probably be having some words on that as well uh, to go along with that movie. It's, it's a really well done movie. Um, so, uh, online, if you're online with us today, uh, we're going to have the songs that Terry has curated for this week. And so, uh, we're going to go ahead and get those set up online for you there. So, make sure you click on the link and go through those. And uh, uh, we can't wait to have that happen as well. Uh, as we start off our, our service this morning here, we want to go to God and open it up with a word of prayer. So let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that we are gathered here together freely and openly today here, that your will is pressed upon us to be here and to hear your words of encouragement, your words of hope, especially this week as we start off this season of anticipation, the anticipation of the coming of the birth of Christ, and at the same time, we are expectantly waiting for Christ to return. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you that you are here in the room with us today and that you're here to touch our hearts and touch our minds with your words and in song today. So Lord, we just praise you and thank you in that ability to gather here. And for those who are not able to be here with us today, we let them up to you today so that they might be able to uh, join with us this morning in this worship time that we have. Uh, Father God, we, we ask that you would hold tight to us today uh, through these trying times that we have in our world. 
and Lord, keep us focused on you throughout so that we don't drown in this world of sorrow and in the darkness that is enveloping this world today. So we praise you and thank you in all these things, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Pastor Terry, in his call to worship today, has chosen Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and that comes from the New Living Translation. And it says, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Those are words of encouragement for people who are going through trials and tribulations in dark times. That fear not, for I am with you. I will never abandon you. And this verse is our prayer in Christ. This verse brings us back to Christ. If Christ had never become human, an approach to his throne would be either intimidating or insolent. Either we had no place to be there, no reason to be there, or we would be totally intimidated by him. But see, he came and he became flesh and dwelt among us so that he could share that humanness with us and restore a relationship with him. Our high priest understands human, this human situation absolutely, totally. Because he lived it so that he could understand us better. If we think back to all the things that God had done and all the people that he had sent before, none of it worked. None of it worked. So he became flesh and dwelt among us so that he could understand that every aspect of that human nature from within. He is not hostile to humanity, but instead became one of us to be able to share his grace and his mercy with us. He wants to help each of us become the kind of human being that he was. He gave us that, that glowing light to show the way to be able to follow his example. He set the example of how our human behavior needs to be to follow him to the throne. When he comes close to, when we come close to him and become like nature to him, a second nature to him, in our behaviors, in our actions towards one another, in our worship to God, then we can approach that throne not out of intimidation, not out of insolence like we don't belong there, but we can approach it with boldness and confidence because he went before us and paved the way for us to have that relationship, to pave that way so that we had a place at the throne to come to. So as we come into this, this time of anticipation and this time of Advent, into this season of Advent, we need to understand how important it was for Jesus to come to be born into this world and then expectantly wait for his return so that we can approach that throne and receive his mercy, receive his grace, receive his love face to face for eternity. Doesn't that sound awesome? What better gift could you ever get in your life? Gracious Lord, we, we praise you and thank you for these words, these words of encouragement, these words of blessing, these words that bring us close to you. We thank you that you came and, and became flesh and dwelled among us and that, Lord, you are here to guide us through to our final place with you. We praise you and thank you in all these things. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he gives the message this morning and we just ask that you, you would open our ears to hear our eyes to see, our hearts to receive that message so that we can live it out day by day by day. In your precious name we pray today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So at this point in time, we're going to have the lighting of the Advent candles. And Steve and Denise have graciously uh, agreed, voluntold, uh, to do this. And so uh, we thank you. Today we light the candle of hope.
Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's Isaiah 40, 31. Hope looks to God and waits on him with the firm expectation that he will fulfill his promises. Allied with hope are the ideas of faith and patience, endurance and trust, of joy and a settled peace that God will do what he says he will do. Israel had been beaten down by a succession of world powers, Babylon, Persia, the Greeks, and now Rome. In their distress, they called out, Come, O oh come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Yet in, this, in the cry, there is hope, a strong expectation that God will keep his promises to send a Messiah, a deliverer. The hope is fulfilled on the first Christmas day when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, God's Savior sent to planet Earth to save us from our sins and deliver us from whatever oppresses, whatever oppresses us. People live in hope of one who can help them. Jesus is that person, present today by the Holy Spirit, to deliver us from any need. He is the one we hope for. So let us pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus into our world, our hope of glory, our blessed hope of resurrection and eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. So glad you didn't have trouble with that quick. You fought with that. Well, good morning. Good morning. So happy to see you all here this morning. It is nice and toasty in here. A little chilly outside, but as Mark said, that snow is, we see that snow, it reminds me of Isaiah when he talks about uh, our sensors. We have that blood that will be as white as snow. So, unfortunately, some of it is melted and we now see that ugly underneath. But that's why we have hope, because God takes away all that ugliness. As we think about hope, we hope for a lot of different things. I was sitting back there, uh, and uh, we were getting ready to pray, and Diane grabs my hands, and I'm, I'm warm, very warm, and her hands were cold, and I was hoping for it. <laughs> I felt so good. But we hope for so many different things. And in this season of Advent, it's it's sometimes you know it's we come together and every year we I'm not gonna step over here. <laughs> every year we sing songs and next week we're gonna go caroling and I am so excited for that number one because we're gonna have a meal again and you know we talked about hope yesterday we hoped we had enough eggs and pancakes and bacon and we did and last night as Mark was cutting up the garlic bread. After he had done it, I said, you know, I'm thinking about Jesus feeding the 5,000. The bread just kept multiplying. <laughs> we, we hoped we had enough food, and we had, we not only had enough food, but we had a full house. God is good. Each, each year we decorate. So we've got our uh, Advent wreath up here. We've got some poinsettias over on the fireplace and around the room. There's a small Christmas tree over there. Online, you can't see it, but there's a Christmas tree over to my left. We're just all decked out for Christmas. We have changed the colors to purple. We've been river green for so long. And we're now on purple. And we walk around. We go out and we talk to people and we wish them what? A Merry Christmas. Regardless of how what they believe, we just wish them a Merry <coughs> Christmas. And we do this even in a world that denies God's existence. We celebrate even in a world that denies God's existence. In fact, a world celebrates with us even though they deny God's existence. However, they think of it maybe as a much different thing than we do. It's Christmas time. And Advent starts today. And it's during this time that we rejoice because we are celebrating Christ's first coming, yet patiently waiting for his return. 
as we watched last night in the Why the Nativity docudrama that we watched, at the very beginning, you might remember seeing the small boy dragging himself along the ground to see the baby. At the very end, we see that grown boy dragging himself to Christ, who reaches down, kneels down to him, and kills him. These are the things that we wait for. It's during this season that my heart wishes this world would join us in celebrating the true meaning of Christmas. But even as believers, how often do we focus our attention on this remarkable story. This is why we want to do this, we keep calling it a new Christmas tradition, but now we're just going to call it a Christmas tradition because it's not new anymore. We're three days in. That's why we're encouraging everyone to read a book or a chapter of the book of Luke each day this month. And you know what? My Facebook feed and my Instagram feed are blowing up with this request. Try this new Christmas tradition this year. Do this. Do this. It's not, it's it's something that is gaining traction. And it's not just because we decided to do it. It's because God has put it on people's hearts to do it. And yes, we don't think about it often. Instead, we spend Christmas time stressing out. Who stresses out because you have to go shopping for Christmas? Oh my gosh, what are we going to buy for Christmas presents? Who wants what? All right, you know, it's like this is what we did this year. Got up, got the family chat up, and said, "Please link your Amazon wish list to this text." And then we got the Amazon wish list, and we went click. Got this, got this, got this. Not buying that. That took some of the stress away, but not all of it. What do we get the boys? Our son in laws. There we go. Nope. nope. I think my battery died. We'll just, go, we'll just go old school here. We'll hold a microphone. This will keep me from getting my hand burned. God has a plan. Amen. Melt the money. Melt the money. Nah, I think we're good. But the other things we stress about, who stresses out about cooking a meal? Two weeks from yesterday, we have our family Christmas. We were stressing about what to have for a meal. Then we decided we were going to do chili, and my daughter goes, you going to have cinnamon rolls? That's a joke around here now. <laughs> and cornbread. My other daughter goes, I don't care what we have as long as we're together. And I was like, who are you? I'm loving this. But you know what we decided? We didn't want that mess in our house. We're going to Pizza Ranch. We don't have to stress out about it. We'll let somebody else do the cooking. But there's also something bittersweet in that because the last time I ate there was the Tuesday before my dad died me in March. So it's kind of a, a blessing in and of itself. And then, of course, there's the decorating. Anybody ever fight about decorating your house? I used I used to be kind of ornery. Diane's raising an eyebrow. So what did I do this year? This year, the most stressful part is digging in underneath the stairway to pull all that stuff out. But you have to get all the stuff that's in front of it out first. So we always do it on the Friday after Thanksgiving. So I pulled everything out and put it in the family room, which is already a storage area anyway. So I just pulled it out. Didn't tell her it was all out in there. And we went down to get it. She goes, when did you do that? I said, I've been working on this all week. I didn't want stress. And we were able to put up our Christmas stuff. And it was actually a nice time. Get rid of that stress. Now, should we regret any of these holiday traditions? Absolutely not. Christmas is a wonderful time to embrace the blessings of our families and our love for each other. However, in the midst of these activities, we need to take the time to remember what Christmas is really about and just 
why it had to happen the way that it did. There is so much more to this story than the birth of a child in Bethlehem. This was a moment of fulfillment. This was the culmination of hundreds of years of prophecy. From Genesis to Isaiah to Micah, the Old Testament is filled with the prophecies concerning the Messiah. These ancient words regarded not only his coming, but also the manner of his coming, the location of his birth, his ancestry, his life, and even his death. It's all laid out in the Old Testament. This is a story that starts in the Garden of Eden and ends with an empty tomb. This is also a story about God's people, about their need for a Savior, our need for a Savior. It's about the need for a sacrifice that would cover our sins forever. This is a story about the hope that we get through the salvation that we are gifted through Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. And although God supernaturally and sovereignly orchestrated each and every detail of his son's birth, the Christmas story is filled with fascinating human profiles and personalities. Imagine, imagine being Mary, a virgin, carrying the Son of God. Imagine being Joseph, his, her loyal and faithful husband. Imagine experiencing visitations by angels sent by God. Imagine being wrapped in the shroud of, of a holy mystery full of very human emotions. And as we have seen both through The Chosen and through the, the docudrama last night, Why the Nativity, this is, these are all scenes that have incredible cinematic experience to them. What we can do with technology today doesn't even compare to what actually happened. We have the Messiah, the King of Kings, born in a, a stable, born in the area where the animals are, and then laid in a manger. Laid, we all worry about putting them on a soft mattress. They put them in a dome trough with, filled with hay, wrapped in strips of cloth. That first they got to worship him, were the lowest of the low in Jewish society. It was the lowly, dirty shepherds, the outcasts. And above, there's a magnificent star. And people have been trying to figure out this star for a millennium. Not giving God the props that he could do that. It doesn't have to be something that can be explained. God did it. And then that star, over the course of a two or three year journey, leads the Magi to come and visit this child. They come, they worship, they give presents, and then they turn around and spend another two or three years going back home. This is the truest drama that has been or ever will be witnessed better than any plot line, any writer. And they can go on strike over this again if they want. They, there's just no way they could write a better plot. So, starting today, let us now rediscover all the beautiful, majestic, and divine elements in this Christmas story. We will be, or we will see by examining question by question that this one moment in time was the pivotal moment of all time, and that it was assembled in such a way that we can only say it was the work of God. That gets us all the way to the beginning of this series, Why Did Jesus Become a Man? And throughout the message today, we're going to talk about five reasons why Jesus came to earth. Can you imagine how Mary must have felt as she gazed at her newborn baby? For you that are, for you women that are mothers, imagine how you looked at your child or your children if you've had more than one when they were first born. 
Now, any child that is born is a miracle. But this child was also a special gift. This child had been set apart from every other child ever born. But why? The angel Gabriel had spoken directly to Mary and her heart confirmed what he said was true. This child that she held was indeed the Son of God. And yet Mary must have had many questions. Why me? Why now? I'm not married. What are people going to think? But we have the question, why did Jesus become a man? The Bible provides us five answers to this vital question. First, Jesus became a man to satisfy the prophecies of the Old Testament. Let's look at Luke 24, 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophet, or the prophets and the Psalms. Everything said about him in the Old Testament had to be fulfilled in his coming. Do you realize that it would be almost impossible to write a complete Christology using only the Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus? I think one of the disciples said it, that if all the things Jesus had done just while he was alive were to be written down, the books would more than fill the earth. From Genesis to Malachi, the scriptures are full of anticipation, full of this hope. And as we've seen through the, the Chosen and, and what we watched last night, why the Nativity, there is an anticipation. The shepherds, when the Lord of Lord, or the, the angels and the Holy Host showed up, they were in awe and they knew exactly what had just happened. Even though the religious leaders would say, eh, that didn't really happen, they knew that it had happened. The prophetic books were written by many different writers at various times throughout the centuries. And yet, together, throughout the words of those prophets, there are glimmers of a Savior, a King, who would rescue his people and restore them to God. The prophet spoke of this one who was to come. In fact, there were more than 300 specific prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures about the promised Messiah. Isaiah said that this de special deliverer would be miraculously born, and he would be born of a virgin, and that his name would be called Emmanuel. Isaiah wrote this not one year before it happened, not 10 years before it happened, but hundreds of years. Hear these words from Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Micah offered a very specific prediction saying that the king would be born in Bethlehem and that he would come from the distant past. Micah 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Jeremiah prophesied that the birthplace would be the site of a terrible tragedy. Jeremiah 31.15 reads, This is what the Lord says, A cry is heard in Ramah, deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for her children are gone. And then we can jump to the New Testament in Matthew 2, 16 and 18, where the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy is revealed. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then 
What was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. These are just a handful of the over 300 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus would fulfill. A mathematician once calculated the possibility of all these prophecies being fulfilled in one person is one, not one in five, not one in ten, one in 83 billion. That's a lot of zeros. That's all of the prophecies. Just trying to do a, less than five of them is beyond anything that we could That leads us to our second point today. Jesus became a man to show us the Father. He came to show us who God is. Look at John 14, 8 and 9 from the New International Version. It says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And stop there. Was it enough? Not for everyone. It's not enough. But Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus was God in a human body. So if you want to know who God is, you need to know who Jesus is because Jesus teaches us who God is. When you see Jesus doing what he did in the Gospels, you are watching God at work. Do you want to know God? Get to know Jesus. It goes to that old saying, know God, know Jesus. There is only one way, and that is to truly know Him. To know Jesus is to know God. John 14, 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So all these religions that are out there telling you that there's more than one way to heaven, I'm sorry they're lying to you. Our third point today is Jesus became a man to save us from our sins. 1 Timothy 1.15 from the New Living Translation says this, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Jesus, or Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. The only way for us to be saved was to have God, Jesus, become a man. And because Jesus was God and man, he lifted up one hand and took hold of the Father. And with the other hand, he reached down and he took hold of man. So as we saw in, in the chosen where Jesus reaches down and pulls Peter up out of the water, that's Jesus reaching. But what we could have also seen is Jesus with his other hand held high, holding the hand of God. It was on the cross that he brought everything together. Now with his hands reaching out, he offers us salvation. He offers it to you, to me, to everyone. Had he not come, well, let's just say we would not be on the right course. It would be like if the GPS in the car was broken. We would be not on the floor if you're using the wrong GPS system or if you haven't updated. You can be on the wrong course. Like driving in the middle of the desert or through into the river. We need to be focused on God. But instead, if we're not focused, we're in a downward spiral. Without any hope. In endless despair. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen that change in my life. I have been in a downward spiral. Viral. When I was in my desert time, I was in a downward spiral. I didn't have much hope, and I certainly was in despair. But when God placed a hand in my life, and she brought me back, 
she, God used her to pull me back into the fold, to bring me back into the family. That all went away. Now, do we still have problems? Absolutely, we still will have problems. Things are still going to go wrong. It's okay, because we have hope. But all this downward spiral, this despair, all this is interrupted because God. He shut down that cycle of sin by sending Jesus to be our Savior. He broke that cycle, that constant cycle. If you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, you cannot know him. And without knowing him, you cannot know God. And without accepting him, you cannot be forgiven. That's the purpose of his coming, was to forgive us our sins. At least the first time. That brings us to our next point. Jesus became a man to sympathize with our weakness. By becoming a man, he was able to experience the things that we experience. Now, granted, without sin, but he got to experience. His dad was a carpenter. i got to imagine he smashed his thumb, hammering a nail. I've got to imagine he had his full share of splinters. All those things. He's gone through everything that we could possibly go through, except he had a better answer to the, what was going on. And he responded differently than maybe we do. But he is our great high priest. He understands all that we go through. And when I think of great high priest, I, my mind immediately goes to Hebrews because Hebrews talks about the great high priest several times. But let's go to verse or chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, which we had for our call to worship. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Do you know why you can go to Jesus with whatever is going on in your life and know that he hears you and understands you? Because he came down. Because he came down to experience everything that we've experienced apart from sin. Dr. Maxwell Maltz is a plastic surgeon. He tells of a man who had been injured attempting to save his parents in a terrible fire. Unfortunately, his elderly parents died in that fire. And he was burned over a great deal of his body, and his face was badly disfigured. He mistakenly interpreted what had happened to him as some sort of punishment from God for not having gotten his parents in his anguish, he refused to let anyone see him, not even his wife. So she went to see Dr. Maltz for help. He said, I can fix him. Very confident, I can fix him. But she knew her husband would turn down any offer of plastic surgery. When she visited him again, he asked why she had come. She said, I want you to disfigure my face so that I can be like him. If I can share in his pain, then maybe he will let me back in his life. Maltz wrote, I had never heard anything like that in my life. I had always been paid to help people look better. She wanted me to make her look like her husband. Of course, he wouldn't do it. But he decided to go and tell her husband what she had said. He knocked on the man's door and said loudly, I am a plastic surgeon and I want you to know that I can restore your face. There was no response. Please come out, he said. Again, no answer. Still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz told the man of his wife's proposal. She wants me to disfigure her face to make her face like yours and hope that you will let her back into her life, your life. That's how much she loves you. There was a brief moment of silence, and then ever so slowly the doorknob began to turn. 
The way that woman felt about her husband is the way God feels about you and me. He took on our face and our disfigurement. He became a man so that God would become touchable, approachable, and reachable. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He gives us hope. Whatever you have been through, you can be sure that God has been all the way to the end of that cup. And when you pray, he will embrace you with his love and say, I have been there and experienced that. We often hear it say, been there, done that. God can say that. He's been there and done that. Our final point today is Jesus became a man to secure our hope of heaven. He came down so that we could go up. This is for everyone. So we think back to the biblical times that was for Jew and Gentile, even though that ticked off the religious leaders. And quite a few of the Jews, in fact. But it's for Jew, Gentile, you and me. Everyone. Colossians 1.27 says this, to them God was chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We must let Christ live in our hearts if we expect to get into heaven. And the only way that you can live in heaven is with Christ in you. Remember what Jesus said when I read John 14, 6 a little earlier. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except for me. There is one way to God. You come to God by coming to Jesus because Jesus is God, and Jesus is the one who paid the penalty for our sins. And one day, if we live until he returns, we will hear the trumpet, and we will go up to be with him. If we should die before he comes, our body will go into the grave and our spirit will go to be with him. If Almighty God has fulfilled all that he said about the first coming of Christ, then we know we can be sure of what he says about Christ's second coming and that it will be fulfilled in the same precise way. Charlie was 10. School was out for Christmas, and the family had chosen to spend the holiday in the country. The boy pressed his nose against the bay window of the vacation home and marveled at the British winter they were experiencing. He was happy to trade the blackened streets of London for the cotton-white freshness of the snow-covered hills. His mom invited him to go for a drive, and he quickly accepted they snaked the car down a twisty road, the tires crunching the snow as they went, and the boy puffed his breath on the window. Now, unless you live in the Midwest, you really don't understand the joy of breathing on the window and drawing. It's like those little deals, well, I'm going to age myself because kids today don't know what these are, but you used to write on this thing, you could lift up the plastic and it would erase it, and you could do it all over again. They actually have electronic ones now. Well, not just that, so got, they, they've got this little thing, it's like a, and it's got a pen, and you can write on it, and, and the same thing as edge sketch, you can shake it away. But it's such a marvelous thing to do. It's not, even as an adult, I like drawing on the window by breathing on it. He was thrilled. You know, 10, you're going to be thrilled. That's going to be fun. His mom, yeah, however, she was a little bit more anxious. She could tell this was more than a normal storm. Heavy snow came down, visibility lessened, and she took a curve. And the car started to slide. And it didn't stop until it was in the ditch. She tried to drive out of the ditch, but she couldn't do it. Ten-year-old little Charlie pushed. She pressed the gas, but they were just digging themselves deeper. Uh, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's like us trying to get out of something instead of relying on God. Digging ourselves a deeper hole. They were stuck and they needed help. 
Well, a mile down the road, there was a house, and off they went and knocked on the door. Of course, the woman told them, of course you can come in. Please come in and warm yourselves. The phone is yours. She offered them tea and cookies and urged them to stay until help arrived. Just an ordinary event, right? Don't suggest that to the woman who opened the door. It was not an ordinary event. She has never forgotten the day. She has retold the story a thousand times, and if she had told it just once. And who could blame her? It's not often that royalty appears on your porch. Well, the two travelers stranded by the English winter were no less than Queen Elizabeth and heir to the throne, 10 year old Charles. Would you forget that day? Mm, I'm not thinking so. That'd be like Jesus coming knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm not going to forget that day. I don't forget the day that he knocked on my heart and called me 100% back to him. But what I want to tell you is something far more wonderful than that happened. Far more wonderful than Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles showing up at that woman's door. Far more wonderful than the love that woman had for her husband wanting to have her face disfigured so that she could show him how much she loved him. The message of Christmas, yes, is a message of royalty, but it's about a royalty from heaven that walked our streets. Heaven's Prince has knocked on the door of your heart and God has moved into your neighborhood. He is one of us. Almighty God is here. And he has you on his heart today and every day. We do not serve a God who is far away. We serve a God who is close at hand, for he has come to be with us. He is our Savior. The Christ of Christmas is here. Heavenly Father, every word in the scriptures points to the gift of hope that you have given us through your Son, Jesus. This hope did not begin when Jesus was born. Throughout the Old Testament, we can see the plan of salvation that you created to restore your people through a relationship with you. It is when Jesus became a man that we truly are able to see and understand the greatness of your love for us. Father, as we read the 24 chapters of Luke each day this month, we pray that we will have an even greater understanding of just how wonderful, how great your love is for us. I pray that you, you open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our minds to understand the greatness of your love for us. Each and every day, Lord, the world throws all kinds of stuff at us, yet nothing is too difficult, too messy, or too dirty for you. That is why you sent your son to give us the gift of eternal life. I pray that no one would leave that wonderful gift of salvation unopened. Lord, we come before you with all our messiness, our difficulties, and the dirt of our lives, and ask that you forgive us our sins. And we declare for all the world to hear that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, that on, this first, on that first Christmas you gave us the gift of hope wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Thank you, Father, for this gift, this immeasurable gift. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Terry, as we come into this time this morning of communion, a time of coming together, that is what Advent is about, is it's a time for us to come together, to celebrate the coming of Christ, to celebrate the return of Christ. So it's a lot of things to celebrate. And it's a time for our hearts to be filled and to remember the sacrifices that were made for us to bring us to the throne of God. 
We can't get there any other way except by Christ. He paved the way for that for us on the cross by taking our sins upon him and going to the cross. He set that plan in motion for us to be able to join with him and come to the Father's throne and to be able to have the salvation, separation from our sins, and a restoration to God, a righteous relationship with God. It was more than just simply a man dying on the cross. It was a restoration relationship that was mended. So as we come into this time of communion today, I want you to remember those things that Christ did for us. That gift that was given us freely and openly out of love because of his wondrous grace. Because of his wondrous mercy. He gives us that gift of salvation. He gives us the promise and the hope of a better tomorrow. A future with him eternally. On the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. And he blessed the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Scripture goes on to tell us that he will not eat of that bread or drink of that cup until he returns into our presence. And so we have a thankful gift and a wonderful God. Let us approach him today in this time of communion with a thankful heart. I will remind you to pull the bottoms off first before you open the cup so we don't take a little bath. The body of Christ broken for you. Take. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. So, oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. It's time for prayers for the people. And for those in need of prayer, for. Um, Anyway, I've done a blanket prayer for everyone that's in need of prayer this morning for pain and suffering and, and that kind of thing. But if there's anything else that anybody would like to ask for prayer for, um, I'd gladly... I'd like to ask for a special prayer for this being winter season that the people that are homeless or disadvantaged that mm -hmm. might be out in that weather and they'd be protected. They'd be protected. Okay. Absolutely. Is there anything else? Okay. All right, Father God, we come to you to worship you today and praise your holy name. For you alone give us life and breath each passing day. You give us joy in our hearts at the midst of trials. You help us to walk in peace and kindness with one another. You give us hope for a good future, and you love us unconditionally. In Job 11, 13 through 18, it states, If you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm without fear. You will surely forget your troubles, recalling it only as waters gone by. Life will be brighter than new day, and darkness will become like morning. You will be secure because there is hope. So as we come together and pray for each other, let us remember that without you, Jesus, in our lives. We have no hope. The evil one comes to seek, kill, and destroy our lives and our children's lives. As adults, we have faced many trials and learned to pray and follow you, Father. But some of our children are facing great trials at this time because they are young and they don't understand. We need your divine intervention in their lives. Please put Christian people in their paths. Send angels down to stop them from hurting themselves or doing something that would force them to spend time in prison. If they have already chosen that path, then Father, I ask you to meet them right where they're at and help them to come off of this path and onto the path you have chosen for them. 
We thank you for their lives, Father God, and we are trusting you to intervene. Bring them into a right relationship with you. Show them mercy and give them wisdom. Help them to place their trust in you and give them hope for each new day. For you have created all of us for such a time as this. And Father, in this time of celebration of the birth of your Son, help us all to remember who we are to be praising and who we are to behave like. I pray for families everywhere to forgive one another of offenses that are meaningless. Help us to love one another as you first loved us. Send us your son, you sent us your son to live among us, to show us how to live with one another in truth and love. And we praise you, Father God, for who you are. Father God, I lift up the homeless people to you today. I pray that you give them shelter, food, and love, Lord God. Keep them safe in all their trials. Help them to search you out and to find you and to find hope in the days ahead. Father God, I lift up all who are here and online that have physical pain, people who have had surgeries or need surgery, people who have mental anguish of heart, mind, and soul, all people who need divine healing throughout their bodies, Lord God. You are the great physician. You can do all things. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. You are able to do far more than we can imagine or desire for ourselves. Knowing this, we pray with confidence that by your amazing grace and your will, O oh God, we might be healed. And we thank you for this blessing. In Lamentations 3, 23 it states, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Praise be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. watching online, please click the link to worship with us to the music. There's a story in that as well. Heavenly Father, you give us a hope that we can get nowhere else. You give us the strength that we can get nowhere else. Sometimes you have us walk through the dark valley because there's a lesson to be learned. There is a spiritual growth to come from, Father. But we have hope that on the other end, you're there. We know you're there. We thank you that you're there. We thank you that you were there in the midst of all of our gunk of our dirt, our messiness, our despair. You are there. Let us reach up to your son and grab a hold of his hand, knowing that through him we have a salvation. A salvation we can get nowhere else. A way to fill the hole in our heart that nothing else can fill. Thank you, in Jesus. Amen. And now as we prepare to end the online portion of our service, I want to send those that are watching online as well as those that are here among us out with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.